This is Venerable Tupton Chojan, uh, one of Ajahn Nisabo's first teachers, if not his, his first teacher. She's been in robes for almost 50 years. 47. 47. Um, 47, 48 on the cusp. Um, but right now we're coming from uh, Shravasti Abbey, which is, for people who don't know it, you should know it, uh, because it is probably the largest congregation of non-Buddhist born Western monastics of any tradition <laughs> in North America. So, um, yeah. So we're very happy to be here. <laughs> That's yeah, that, yes, good point. They're Buddhists, totally Buddhist now. Yep. Yep. And we're also joined today by our sister Aya Ahimsa, who began training in 2013 and took full bhikkhuni ordination in 2017 and has become a dear friend of us as well. And we're just delighted to actually have this chance to, to speak with you both. And um, what we usually have done in these conversations, we think they're a very valuable part of our annual visit, is we get to ask Venerable Children questions for a while. And then um, Venerable Ch Children grills us about things for a little bit. And then we open up the uh, session to the community as a whole. And does that sound uh, good to you, Venerable? Okay, great. So we'll go from there. And uh, Ajahn, I think we're beginning with some rapid fire questions. Oh yes, several pages of a little book. <laughs> well, just to frame the whole conversation, um, we would love to just have the whole thing within the frame of monastic training. You've been training monastics um, in multiple countries, but here for a long time. And yeah, it's monasticism is something which most Westerners aren't familiar with. So giving some context for people who are interested in monastic life and for people who are already in robes, uh, it's always good to hear different perspectives and from different traditions. But starting off with our first rapid fire question, would you rather train a monastic who slept too much or ate too much? <laughs> you may have to. <laughs> we're not telling. We're we're not telling. <laughs> <laughs> we have another one for you if you want, Venerable. Okay, so, um, <laughs> skip. Okay, so, um, if you, what's the, the next best one we can ask? Our other rapid fires were similar to that one, so I'm having to totally, <laughs> totally change. Um, when deciding uh, to work with a stubborn character, have you found, um, when have you found fierceness working well versus compassion? Do you have any stories for each of those kind of uh, bearing fruit or not? How do you decide? So somebody with a what? Com a stubborn, stubborn character. Some like of the myself. difficult. I would not deign to say such things. But if you... <laughs> you better not. I definitely would not. <laughs> so. Only I can say that. <laughs> Um, hmm. Well, in terms of working with myself, I can be quite stubborn in some ways. Um, I can see some of my stubbornness is, um, is clarity, and I've got to go forward, yeah? So not all my stubbornness is bad. Um, the stubbornness that gets in the way is uh, the one that I, I try and work with a lot, the one that uh, gets entrenched in some story that I'm telling myself about how ill I am being treated. Um, you know, and then the mind stays stubbornly in, in a stupid story. Yeah? And so, uh, how do I work with that? I kind of recognize the story and then uh, ask myself, is that true? And the story is never true. 
and then when I find out it's not true, it's very easy just to drop it. In terms of training other people who are stubborn, i ask them. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think there's some candidates out here. <laughs> Just to uh, back up a bit to that first half of the question, uh, could you say more before we go into the, um, the mix of how you train other people, could you speak at all about your own monastic upbringing, like how you were trained as uh, a young Samaneri and then a young Bhikshuni? And yeah, I would love to hear some of those, those details. And specifically, uh, something which yeah. people on our channel won't know is uh, if you could say what tradition you're a part of and how that fits into to things. Okay, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> and uh, I was trained mostly in Nepal and India. Um, first at Kopan and then in Dharamsala. How was I trained? This is part of my stubbornness. What I see with my teacher um, is he couldn't, he couldn't just say, you know, children, you have a problem with anger. Uh, because I would have, back then, I would have said, no, I don't. I don't yell, I don't scream, I don't throw things. I'm a sweet person. Uh, and so if they had told me I had a problem with anger, I would have said no. Um, so what they had to do is they had to put me in a situation that was difficult so that I could see that, that, yes, I do have a problem with anger. And so I found that throughout my monastic life, there's been many difficult situations that I've had to go through. And uh, some of them my teacher put me in, some of them I put myself in, uh, but l they were all very, very good. You know, they were extremely difficult, very painful, but very good in the end you know, for, for really training and uh, working with the mind. I, I believe you had a question for Venerable too. I shall leave the mic. Oh, thank you. Um, when, when you meet a new candidate, um, are there particular qualities that you look for or particular, particular qualities that you've found uh, help someone be suitable for monastic life or particular motivations? I think motivation is critical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like we're having an upcoming Exploring Monastic Life program and some of the people who sign up for it are basically brand new to Buddhism but have this idea of kind of, wouldn't it be romantic to become a monastic? Uh, so I say yes, they can come to the to the program because I think it gives them some information. Um, but I don't really, at that stage in their development, say, think, oh, you know, they're suitable candidates because they're brand new. Yeah. And you, you know, you have to kind of uh, check, you have to observe people, but really see what their motivation is. You know, we've had one. Uh, young man come here some years ago. I, I talk about him a lot because uh, he came and he said, I want the bliss. Yeah, <laughs> I want to uh, develop shamatha. I want the bliss. And uh, of course, you know, here we take care of our own community. It's, we don't have people, we have to cook, we clean, we do everything ourselves. So I remember one day he was uh, cutting apples with you. And uh, yeah, and I happened to pass by and he, you know, again went on this thing about how he really wants the bliss. So he didn't stay very long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, cutting apples, working in the forest wasn't blissful enough for him. So I recommended that he go to uh, Bunty, uh, Bunty G's place, yeah. Uh, so, you know, the motivation, I think, comes from people who have learned the, the Dharma and have really reflected on it deeply. And then, you know, are they aspiring 
for awakening? Or are they um, just seeking some respite from the pain of this life? You know? Because um, many people come, and I'm sure you have this too, uh, who have done mindfulness, yeah, um, secular mindfulness, you know, and and then, you know, what is the, they come to, some of them come to Buddhism after that, some of them don't, but, uh, you know, the motivation for secular mindfulness is basically to feel better in this life, which is fine, you know, everybody wants to feel better in this life, but in terms of being a good candidate for ordination, no, that motivation doesn't work. So, Venerable, if the motivation is key at the beginning, uh, how do you sustain that through 10, 20, 30 years? Like, in what's the wellspring of well being in your monastics that keeps them going? And how do you, well, you ensure that it? You ask them. I'm, I can tell you for me personally, but I can't speak for them. Well, how do you cultivate? How do you give them access to that? Okay. Well, we screen people and prepare them and train them. You know, um, but I think just in our daily schedule, we are constantly reminded of our motivation. Uh, so at the end of morning practice. There's a verse called the monastic mind that everybody says. And then, um, you know, uh, after breakfast, then there's chanting before breakfast. Then after breakfast, there's a stand-up meeting uh, right before we offer service. And there's a motivational verse that, w that we say there, too. Um, so always coming back to the idea of, you know, our ultimate goal is to become a Buddha so we can most effectively, most effectively be of benefit to all beings. And we hear that again and again at the beginning of every meditation session. You know, the, the community people take, take, take turns uh, speaking a, a motivation from their own life very often. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, before all the teachings, we generate the motivation, before all the meditation sessions. So it's something that again and again and again we come, come to. And we're also taught that first thing in the morning when you wake up, motivation, bodhicitta, compassion, wisdom. You know, even you're just saying the words in your groggy, you know, half-awake state, you try and make the first thing you come to when you wake up in the morning, you know, your dharma motivation. And so I think that that really uh, helps people to sustain it. I don't know, what do you people think? What helps you? Yes, it's all that Venerable said. And in the middle of all of that, stuff happens. And when you're here, you can't distract yourself from the stuff that happens that you don't like. And so you really end up kind of firewalking your old patterns, your old habits of how you like to have things. And so the bodhicitta motivation and the compassion, you start looking at the reason I want to change this mind that's not happy right now, that's trying to control the situation, trying to, you know, just get what it wants, is that the whole world needs people who don't have that kind of mind. You know, you have to be willing to be flexible. You've got to be willing to look at the, the, the lack of predictability and insecurity on this, on, in this world and try to work with that as an asset rather than something that's going to be tripping you up all the time. So in Tibetan Buddhism, there are these thought training teachings. All around bodhicitta is when stuff happens, you can transform that into the path. And all of my spiritual shopping in 40 years, I had never gotten to a spiritual tradition that gave me a map to show me how to let go of my misery and to find something else that was, that was stronger and clearer and more helpful. It's, it's like, I, I'm a totally different person. I can't say that about most of my life. 
And if I hadn't found this, the Abbey and, and met Venerable, I don't know what I would be doing right now. I'd be in a pretty sore state. So I think that there's something very powerful about living in community. The rock tumble analogy really functions. And you do get your sharp edges smoothed off. And you do start to get polished as the years go on, provided you're willing to do the work for the benefit of Buddhahood. I'm curious about committing. Oh, please. No. Did you want to say something? I think the thing that helps people stay here is watching themselves and other people grow. And I would say, um, that one thing that I would say about you is that <laughs> that where you have a big part of this is um, you have like like 99% accuracy for finding the self-centered thought and 0% tolerance. <laughs> and it's, this is what makes us all miserable and you're willing to help us to learn to let go of that and then we actually become a lot happier as human beings, and I think also we learn through the motivations that we set to have a kind of a motivation that's bigger than ourselves, and that I think that makes people happier. And we, to, for me personally, I get so much joy out of knowing that, okay, our schedule is crazy, everybody agrees, okay, good. <laughs> but what happens with that schedule is everybody uses their time well, and all the guests who come here, and all of us who live here, we use our time well, and you see the benefit that just flows for everyone, and that's a real source of joy. Oh, this is great. Anybody else? Yeah, please. So what they said is absolutely true, and um, when we start to go near rock bottom, it's not unexpected in that, you know, when we're first even requesting ordination, I believe all of us get told, okay, now go and write that down. Remember right now, you are so excited about ordaining. Remember why this is, write it down. And those days where you wonder why the heck have you done this, you go back and look at that. So, and I, I think especially when we live here and we're training as Anagarakas, you know, you kind of see that every day is not perfect, that monastics are struggling in different ways, not just with each other um, or the schedule, but sometimes just with your own motivation, your own practice, your own self-confidence, um, you know, wondering if you've made, you know, the right choice to ordain. And, and to be able to look back and say, what is it that I thought, you know, a year ago, 10 years ago, whatever it was when I ordained, that was clearly the wisdom mind. That was, that was clear-sighted okay, right now I'm afflicted. And so I think that is part of what helps us is that, yeah, we're, not every day is perfect. And I can recognize that afflicted mind and say, well, I've, I've thought wisely before. I will keep trusting that mind. I would say that um, Venerable Children has designed the perfect environment for people to practice, um, but it's up to them how seriously they want to do it. And so I would say uh, you can't just live here and go along and expect to be fulfilled or expect to be mm, happy. <laughs> <laughs> You have to keep meditating on the defects of cyclic existence and meditating and questioning where does real happiness come from and continuing to do that every single day and every difficulty you encounter applying the Dharma. And yeah, so it's really, I think you were alluding that, ask them, it's up to them <laughs> why they're still here. So to continually remind the practitioner that it really relies on them. The teacher can only do so much, but of course, she has provided all the conditions that we need 
to practice as, sin as sincerely as we wish. The benefit that this place brings to people is also a huge motivation, the vision to contribute to the vision. Um, we have so many outreaches, like the SAFE program, the YouTube channel, the various venerables who go out to teach in all different places, the teaching tours that you do. We hear so much feedback about the benefit um, and how it changes lives. And so knowing that being a part of making that vision happen in any way is fulfilling when we see the long-term benefits, especially when we've had people connected to us for so long and they keep coming back and they just thank us for being here. That is inspiring to stay here. Anybody else? This is great. We'll probably have more chances. Um, <laughs> Actually, would you mind answering this question? I've decided to move here. <laughs> I mean, what introduced and kind of allowed for all of those beautiful reflections was you talking about a daily Dharma motivation and being clear about what that is. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious in this tradition about Sangha motivation, that's what people were talking about. and in terms of the practicality, what is expected of in, in terms of the longevity of a monastic life that people are committing to? Um, like the, uh, the map that Venerable Sim Simke was talking about or you know, writing in one's book that Venerable uh, Rin Chim was talking about. When people say they're going to ordain and when people do ordain, are these lifetime vows, or is it like... You bet. Yeah, okay. And could you talk about that? What is it? What it is, is the mind that... Yeah. How do you maintain that idea? Because you, presumably anybody it. can just take off the robes at any time. Yeah, yeah. of course, Ian. Nobody's keeping you in robes. But, but the thing is, it is a lifetime commitment, and people know that when they get into it. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to have a, a clear motivation that you want to get out of samsara and you want to help other people do that too. Yeah? And yeah, if you don't have that motivation, then you're going to be miserable as a monastic. Yeah, I mean, I'm just asking because in the Thai tradition that we're a part of, I think it's the extreme minority of monks who take lifetime vows. Like most monks are taking temporary ordination, and even like some of our teachers, like Ajahn Pasano, the abbot of Abhayagiri, he's been in robes almost 50 years. Um, yeah, he just took a temporary ordination, and then like many monks, he said, we'll just see how it goes in this kind of day-to-day -day approach. So it's a different, different mind, and I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, well, Arvanaya, in, in, you know, both the Malishwastavada Vinaya that the Tibetans keep and the Dharma Guptaka Vinaya that we keep from the Chinese tradition, um, in both instances, it's, you know, you are taking a lifetime vow. You know, you're, make, you're making a lifetime commitment. And I think, maybe I'm totally wrong, but I think in the Theravada Vinaya, the Pali Vinaya, it would be the same. Uh, but what's happened is, um, you know, then the inventing the, the short-term motivation, you know, having people come and during the Varsa, you know, for three months, even they're married, whatever, uh, you know, come and, and ordain as a monk for three months. And so that tradition um, evolved. And in one way, it's good because it gives many people the opportunity to see what monastic life is. But on the other hand, for it makes the stabil long-term sp stability of the Sangha a little bit like this because from the beginning, people aren't saying, this is the most important thing in my life, what I'm going to do. They're more saying maybe, you know, well, this is nice for now, I'll try it out. 
And that makes a big difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but Venerable Dipton Children, I would really like to ask um, how you make decisions about when to keep uh, monastic rules very strictly and when you um, loosen up on that, or if you ever do. And if you do, what, what, are, the, what are the criteria that you make those kinds of decisions? Uh, well, first of all, the way we to keep we keep the vinaya is we acknowledge that uh, you know the the vinaya precepts were set down for a different culture and a different historical time, and so what we do is we look for what is the affliction that each precept is aimed at combating, and uh, and then we see okay. Um, maybe it's difficult to keep that precept literally, uh, but how can we keep the reason behind it and work at that same, you know, um, that work to c control or n subdue that same affliction? So that's, you know, so we have our own Shravasti Abbey way of, of dealing with, you know, different things. Then within that, uh, well, you saw an example today, you know, when we were uh, with singing. Yes. Chanting. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and we do that from time to time uh, as, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's a way we often do it when we want to pay tribute to somebody or point something out, you know, some virtuous quality. Um, so we do that. We have skits that, you know, can be very funny and very silly. Um, we have Buddha Bear. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is Persevering Prairie Dog, who is a disciple of Buddha Bear. Yes. Welcome. <laughs> uh, so, you know, w we do that, and, and we do fun things sometimes. Not, you know, I'm, I like to clown around, and so I drag everybody with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think sometimes we can get way too serious. You know, one of my teachers, Lama, Lama Dupton Yeshe, he would make us laugh like crazy. But he made us laugh at ourselves, you know? And I thought, th you know, that had a really good effect where you could see your own crazy mind and laugh at it instead of take, take yourself so seriously, you know? Oh. I ate one bite of food after midday. Oh no, this is terrible. I'm going to hell. No, it's the Preta realm you go to because that one's concerning food. Oh no, I better find somebody and, and confess right away. I don't care what you're doing. You've got to stop it because I have to confess to you. You know? And, and we can get, sometimes just get so... Um, dogmatic <laughs> yeah and that kind of mind doesn't help <laughs> at all yeah and so I think you know to keep precepts for you know for your life you have to be able to laugh at yourself yeah. venerable um, we might open things up somewhat soon as well but this isn't on the theme but I can't help but ask is is green tar real and how is she real? What does real mean? What does real mean? <laughs> no, I'm asking you. <laughs> so we asked Venerable uh, Tenzin Palmo this, and she said that she'd heard it asked to another Lama, and he said, Green Tara knows that she's not real. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because on the one hand, I mm -hmm. believe in devas, and 
I believe the bodhisattvas are simultaneously a way of recollecting devas and recollecting the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And Ajahnanan, my teacher, frequently, we have a shrine to Avalokiteshvara. And he says that there is always a being who occupies that station, but it can be a different being over time. Um, and well, so- There's many Avalokiteshvaras. Are there many green Taras? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so is because, it a certain, yeah, because please. Because many people do that practice. They get enlightened in the aspect of Avalokiteshvara. They get enlightened in the aspect of green Tara. So, so there's many of them. But they can also appear as other deities and as other things too. So when you get enlightened in the aspect of a deity or bodhisattva, does your mind stream merge or become of the same resonance or note with that bodhisattva? Yeah, when, it, well, we, we call them bodhisattvas, but they're actually Buddhas appearing as bodhisattvas, okay? But uh, yes, they say when they talk about the minds of all the Buddhas, they're individual mind streams that came from individual sentient beings but their realizations are all the same. And that, that answer of Green Tara, no, she's not real, is that's a very good answer because saying Green Tara is, you know, recognizing conventional truth, conventional existence, and then saying she's not real is talking about her ultimate nature. Maybe just, I mean, on this note of Avalokiteshvara, skill and means, and yeah, can be very helpful and very loving and very joyful and bringing you know joy to people, but can also you know bring some discipline um, to things. And I'm curious, you had mentioned you know the bringing joy to the community, but also in your own uh, monastic training, you said things were really difficult. So how do you balance? You know, if the whole path was just a path of pleasure, you know, then. There wouldn't be a point for the monastery, right. yeah. But but how do you also balance? Not everything that's difficult and painful is actually helpful. So how do you? You can make it helpful. Yeah. Hmm. If you say to yourself, "Not everything that's difficult and painful is helpful," then when I have difficulty, I'm justified in feeling sorry for myself, and <laughs> going and sucking my thumbs and <laughs> complaining about other people and blaming other people for my misery, and I'm totally justified, and I could keep doing that. Yeah, if you say, you know, that that's saying that things are inherently existent. That's saying that you know, a situation exists the way it appears to you, to your own, you know, messed up, afflicted, ignorant mind. Yeah, and so I think when you really see that how, especially when you're unhappy and you have problems, how the, the way we interpret things is what makes it so difficult. It's not the situation, it's the way we explain the situation to ourselves. Okay. Do you have a, a metric for determining which types of practices you're gonna bring to the monastic community? Something which is maybe difficult and seemingly not so useful or difficult, but obviously useful or Joyous oh, and no, these kinds of things happen just in ordinary life. I, I, I don't try and make people miserable. They do that by themselves. Goodness. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when somebody's unhappy, if somebody thinks, you know, oh, that person made me mad, that is a wrong conception. Nobody makes you mad, yeah? You look at the situation and say, well, according to my self-centered thought, that what that person is doing is totally unacceptable, and I'm going to fight against it and tell the world how awful they are until they stop doing it, you know? And all that's coming from one's own mind. It's not coming from the other person. 
the other person just says some remark. <laughs> you know? Like I ask them to do something and they look at me and say, no. You know, it's like, <laughs> you're saying no to me? How can you say no to me? Don't you know who I am? <laughs> well, I don't know who I am either. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, if I go on some trip because somebody said no, that's my doing. Because I could look at the situation totally differently. Here's somebody, I asked them to do something, they don't want to do it, they said no. Okay, now I do have an obligation to train that person. Yeah, so sometimes I just say okay, let it go. Yeah, and sometimes I'll say something right to them at that moment. It just depends on what I feel like. <laughs> I am, so did you have another question? You should ask some of those. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Please, oh, uh, they, they can you know, explain this. Please, do let's do it. We do. Is that okay? We'll could, open up the forum. Could, yeah, could we open up the floor if people were, would be willing to share a poignant, pivotal, helpful, uh, maybe painful training training time with Venerable Tipton children, or, <laughs> or 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 with each other, or with others in the in the no. <laughs> yeah, can we? If if anyone. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, can, ha are there any a advice on helping us to choose between Theravada and Mahayana? And also, at what point do we need to make that choice? Because I have heard Bodhicitta blocks you from stream entry if you do too much of it. Um, but that also, it's essential to start with bodhicitta on if you choose the Mahayana path, th th thing, things, things like that. Uh, how do we know which path is right for us and how soon do we need to choose? Well, I think the theme of the question we are going to have is lim uh, liminal points in people's monastic or training and that is a fascinating question to seed with uh, Mahayana and Theravada monastic sitting up front, so we can navigate that however we want in terms of bringing people up to answer the original question, or we could address that one. Venerable, what would you prefer? I would love to hear your answer. Me too, yeah. please. Yes. I say go figure it out yourself. <laughs> yeah? I can't figure it out for you. You have to figure it out yourself. And you have to figure it out before you make commitments, mm -hmm. yeah? But, um, you know, you have to, yeah. And you also have to, see, I didn't have that problem. I just met these teachers and what they said made sense and I kept going back and that was it. You know, I, I didn't have the 31 flavors that I had to taste and figure out, it was like, what they said made so much sense to me. That's what I want to do. And that hasn't uh, changed in all these years. So it's uh, somebody, it would be better for somebody who's unsure. Venerable children, may I speak to that one? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm massaging COVID, did you want to? Um, So for me, I feel, and I don't know how well this fits into, you know, the Mahayana and Theravada 
paradigms and worldviews, but I feel like I have a lot of Mahayana Kama and history and incarnations in my life. I feel really strong resonance with the Tibetan tradition. And in the present moment, I've never, good practice has always felt like good practice to me. And I've never seen a fork in my road in the sense that, you know, I came here for exploring monastic life and Venerable Children was one of my key teachers from about 13, 14 years old. <laughs> And I love this place, and I feel, you know, the monastics here keep such, um, just such crisp, uh, a direct, sincere path, and I'm extremely inspired by it. And I've always just felt this deep resonance with the Pali teaching and the Pali canon and the Theravada tradition. And um, that's persisted, and... You know, for me, I do cultivate loving kindness and bodhicitta, and and yet I don't know exactly where my path goes. Like maybe, you know, by following the Dhamma, um, I do find I've traveled through several lifetimes doing good, building a monastery in Seattle, and then after a time, maybe uh, enlightenment happens, or maybe I return to the Theravada path or Mahayana path. With Ajahn Chah, he built immense paramita spiritual perfections over many lifetimes. But I think the fact that he attained arhantship the moment, the lifetime he did, released a supernova of goodness into the world at exactly a moment when he needed it. And I think maybe that was the most benefit he could have possibly done. And so for me, I think the Dharma is mysterious. And when you begin to talk about these upper echelons of practice, things become quite confusing. Like in the biography of Milarepa, he ascends to the Dhammakaya. What's that? In Ajahn Mun's biography, his enlightenment experience, he's visited by a bunch of former Buddhas. What's that? And so for me, I, I've, I've just found like, I don't know what my path is long term. I know right now what the Dharma is calling me to do, and I do that. But, you know, you really find that, um, I find that the, the deeper the practitioner's commitment that you're speaking to, the less these distinctions seem to matter to me. And I, so I feel, you know, such resonance with the monastics here. Um, I just have a, a little bit of a sneaky workaround is that I've been attending Dharma Realm Buddhist University at Mahayana, Chinese Mahayana University for the last four years. And my main practice meditation is the mantra, Guan Yin or Guan Yin Budo. Um, and kind of my hope is that Guan Yin will help me become an Arhant as fast as possible. <laughs> but, but I'm not like trying to force that. I'm not trying to force that angle, but it's just say it, help me be awake in the present moment. So, see what happens. Be wary, you're not gonna get away with that. <laughs> Well, maybe we could open that up to um, the monastics here, if anyone's willing to share their own poignant points about uh, about training here, the things which have helped you stay in robes and uh, the benefits of the training that happens here and the specifics of it, because a lot of us, um, most, uh, it's so kind of sad that uh, so many, at least from my point of view, I know so little about most other Buddhist traditions and it would be a benefit both to monastics and to the largely Theravada audience that watches Clear Mountain interviews um, to hear about what the training is like in this tradition and what people have found useful because it might be different, it might be the same, but just having a, a broader range of perspectives is great. my poignant moments with my teacher. Um, we have a, she has a saying here, and she gets it a lot, yes, but. And in the beginning years, she got that from me at least, oh, four or five, six times a day. <laughs> because even though I was willing to give up some of the lay life distractions, I was really not ready to give up my opinions. There were times when I would lock my knees and she'd be giving just simple directions, simple 
instruction to do something a little bit different, not even like totally radically different than what I was doing, whether it was the garden or the forest or ma writing an email or just plowing the snow or something. And it was all this yes, but stuff. And there were two moments that, and so, so we ended up having these impasse. It, after a while, she didn't bother. You know, you, you can't, what can you do with somebody that just is always just locks their knees and says, I'm going to do it my way? Or I'd come and ask her for advice, and then I'd have a yes, but after she'd given me some advice. So I started having this ritual with her. I, only, I think I did it three times in the course of my early monastic life, where she would be coming out of the writing studio, and I would go on that stone path, and I'd make three prostrations, and I'd say, Venero, I'm so sorry for being a butthead. <laughs> <laughs> and it was over. And then maybe a few weeks later, <laughs> I'd lock my knees and have a, a better idea, and then I'd have to do it again. So this became a little bit of a dance that I had with my teacher in the early years because my attachment to my ideas and my opinions, because of this whole misconception where I thought an autonomous, free-thinking woman should behave like, that I had no idea on how to listen to what Venerable had to say. And over the past 20 years, I think I've gotten better about this. Um, I still have a yes, but every once in a while. Um, but there's the arrogance. And because Venerable's not, how do I say this? She knows when somebody's receptive. And if when a yes, but comes around, there's no receptivity to hear her. And one of the things that Venerable has, has asked for, particularly in the, in the last few years, is that she needs to be seen and, and she needs to be heard and she needs to be listened to, even just to hear what her ideas are. And so I see this as something, maybe it's a Western thing, maybe, I don't know, but we all have this pattern with, a lot of us have this pattern with her that she never gets heard. And she's not a screamer, she doesn't have this big, loud, bellowing voice. And after a while, she just shrugs her shoulders and says, whatever, do whatever. And it's so much, it's, it's, it's a physically exhausting for her, it's emotionally exhausting for her to have to go, you know, put up with this. And so in my years as I get, and then of course the, ripe, the karma ripens, right? Because now I get to be in somewhat of these roles and I'm getting all the, I'm getting the yes buts. So the karma is ripening for SMK on what that feels like. And of course I don't have the patience that she had. Sometimes she would wait long enough and I'd come around and I would hear her. So I really, one of the difficult things of being in a very strong, our strength in this community to survive is, is sometimes, the, it, it turns into a defilement, it becomes an obstacle to our, to our relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. So how to be able to use obstinacy and stubbornness and determination and having a clear idea of how to move forward are great qualities and we have a lot of strong people in this community but, but sometimes we kind of run over our abyss with those that kind of strong personalities. <laughs> so there's, I'm, I mean, there, this, is a, this has been a life process for me to let go of my ideas and my opinions. And, you know, she's, she's figured out a way to, to work with my shortcomings on this side. But it's something that I see her continually dealing with the community at large is the yes, but um, the attachment to ideas and opinions. So mine's a little twofold in that it wasn't actually with Venerable, but it was with someone who you trained, and I think that there was a, a real channeling there, and this was some years ago, and I was having a heated discussion with someone because I was right and they were wrong, and um, so one of the senior nuns walks in and kind of you know, yell, uh, yells, says strongly, you know, what is going on, or, you know, stop, stop it, or whatever it was. And I was pretty sure she was scolding the other person who was very wrong. And no, she wasn't. She was telling me 
to stop what I was doing, pay attention to what was going on, to, you know, stop. And it was just so clear that up to that moment, again, as she started speaking, I was pretty sure she was in fact scolding or admonishing, whatever word you want to use, the other person. And, and no, it was to me. And so that really, it was like, you know, hitting a rock wall of like, oh, wow, you know, stop and look at my mind. Um, and so, you know, yeah, really catching it and realizing how afflicted I was in that moment and being able to then apologize to her and to apologize to the person involved. Um, and it's something that really made that deep impact on me now, however many years later. And so it's something I look for and I, I still, I'm sure, fall into that a little bit, but not at all. Oh, there's laughing. <laughs> Um, but, but not at all to the same level it was then. And so while that wasn't actually with you, I have heard that person tell stories where you basically did that for that senior nun. Um, so, so I think that that's both, you know, that ability in this community to give feedback, um, and sometimes it being really sharp and strong, but it, that can wake people up in, in the right uh, in in the right moment. And our structure here, where Venerable is not the only one giving training and giving feedback, but that we have our, our three harmonizers and we recognize, you know, a number of senior nuns who are in mentoring roles, who are in roles where they're guiding juniors. And um, I think that's that's part of our training too, is that as Venerable Semke was sharing, uh, you sometimes get to be on the receiving end of those things, and so being, you know, now a, a, the, you know, a very junior big shuni, it's like, okay, there are people senior to me who are going to give me feedback. Am I yes butting them? Because I might be turning around and asking one of the novices to do something and get that same response. I do. <laughs> no, Joe, Joseph, you're good. It, you see, yes, but. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, we do butt heads with each other and break off those um, edges of the rocks. But also, we know that each person is uh, doing their best and um, really cares about us and wants us to grow and we can see each other growing. And so there's a lot of uh, love and connection within the community that keeps us going. And uh, even though we do have bad days, um, we still support each other and it's still a really beautiful time that we spend together, even good days, bad days. We share that all together and we hold each other with love and compassion regardless of What's going on? What afflictions arise? And then they fall away. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was so frustrated with someone. And I used to go in the woods a lot more. That was my solace to uh, to heal. And uh, instead of coming back with nasty words, I decided there were, there were things I wanted to say to this person. And I kid you not, that same exact person started walking up the hill right towards me. And uh, I told her, I care about you. And I want to get along and make this work. And we had this beautiful moment of just sharing and understanding that we were both suffering and it was painful to go through this experience of hating each other and constantly, Arr. so, um, you know, it wasn't perfect, of course, after that, but um, <laughs> we grew and we shared and we had that moment and uh, over time, things got better and better. And um, we cultivate these good qualities and I see people growing and, uh, yeah, it's not easy, but it works. Sahadu. I think if we do only have about 30 minutes left, Venerable, how would you feel about opening up the forum for general questions towards all, every and all monastics? I 
Hello. Thanks for coming. Um, I have I have a question about um, unconditioned awareness. I think I've heard it called chitta. Could you um, explain that? <laughs> so, um, oh gosh. So I think one thing that's really relevant here is um, Thomas Aquinas talked about two roots to talk about God or truth, and one is cataphatic and one is apophatic. And cataphatic is speaking to truth or God, describing it by what it is, and apophatic is describing God or truth by what it isn't. There's the story of Michelangelo uh, carving a, uh, you know, this beautiful sculpture of a horse, and someone asks, how did you turn the rock into that horse and he said I just it was easy I just chipped away everything that wasn't the horse so I think one of the real dangers with bright meditative states is they're, they're the most beautiful thing most people have ever touched and the uh, draw to take them as enlightenment or God or the ultimate is almost irresistible and it happened to the Buddha's two first teachers, Alara Kalama and Uddhaka Ramaputta. They both took the base of uh, nothingness and neither perception nor non-perception as enlightenment. So I think the Buddha saw this pitfall and he tailored his teachings, I think, to be the most precise apophatic methodology, I think, in history. So, so much of his teaching is saying, look, let go of dukkha, let go of these are the five khandas, you are not the body, you are not your perceptions, you're not your feeling, these are the ways we attach. And what you come to once you've let go of all dukkha, he called nibbana. Um, the most clear analogy he gave for it was light that lands on nothing. And yes, it's unconditioned, it's the unconditioned. And I think he was very, uh, intentional, people pushed him to describe it more. When people in the suttas ask, does after death, does the Tathagata exist, not exist, both exist and not exist, neither exist nor not exist, the tetralemma. This is them asking what's left when the body of an enlightened being is gone? What is, what is unconditioned awareness in and of itself? And he said, these do not apply. You know, and so I think he, people pushed him on this exact question again and again, and he was, so precise in saying, I'm giving you a methodology. And I think he wanted to give us a, a teaching which was crystalline and restrained and precise that would last for millennia. And as soon as you begin to talk about what unconditioned awareness is, you really risk people reifying it and getting stuck on it. And I find that every tradition since, you plant that kernel of the Buddha's words in different soils um, and it grows into this flowering where people do circle around these articulations of unconditioned awareness, you know. People talk about the citta. I think there's ways of thinking about Buddha nature, which are resonant with the enlightened mind, perhaps are the same thing. Um, and I think that's necessary for us to not to just intuit a, a blank darkness. And I think we need to take seriously the Buddha's restraint around that as well in terms of so anyways, I, I love the question. I ask it about of pretty much every enlightened being I ever meet, and usually they divert me in this exact way. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. Ajahn Venerable? I'll divert. <laughs> okay. Are you saying that the awareness is of the unconditioned? It's awareness of uh, nirvana? Or are you saying that the awareness itself is unconditioned? Or are you saying you don't know because you're not, uh, you know, you haven't seen it? Yes. <laughs> so I haven't, I'm not enlightened. I haven't touched the deathless. Um, you know, and, and as to, it, it's difficult because the closest I think the Buddha gets um, often is talking about citta um, and yeah, I, I don't want to go deeper. I, I mean, I think the Buddha really acknowledged we can't conceive of what's deathless. It's beyond words. I mean, just think of quantum mechanics, you know, um, just the two-slit experiment where you send a, a photon through two slits and somehow it simultaneously goes through both. 
It's a wave and a particle, and it makes no sense to conceptual mind. And I think the Buddha just acknowledged we can only conceive of so much. So look, Nibbana is good. Keep going for it. Put down everything that's not that. And when you get there, it's worth getting to. And it is justified in and of itself. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all I think is, you know, light that lands on nothing. I don't know. Um, I read a sutta recently, and I was wondering if I could ask for some feedback. So the, the sutta was um, one who abstains, encourages, and approves and praises the abstaining from non-virtue is deposited into a heavenly state. So the formula, so when the, there are ten non-virtues, and when we abstain from these ten non-virtues, and we encourage, approve, and praise these abstain, abstaining from non-virtues, this will deposit one into a heavenly state. And I was wondering if um, what the relationship between virtue is with uh, compassion and emptiness. Because um, what happens is, say for example, say we abstain from drinking intoxicants, right? And we encourage and we approve and praise, we should give up drinking intoxicants. And then one day we find out that we see that I used to drink this. I used to really enjoy this. And now I see a whole shelf full of alcohol when I walk into a cafe and m the mind doesn't move. And there seems to be an absence there. And I was wondering, and we rejoice in that. I was wondering, is that a form of emptiness that we're cultivating in the practice that, that there's something here that's not longer there, and that's joyful. Like, that's the thing that arises. I was wondering if I could get feedback from spiritual friends. Thank you. If I understood what you were saying correctly, it seems to me that. Um, when that happens, it's something that used to really just magnetize your mind. All of a sudden, you, well, not all of a sudden, but after working on it for a while, you say, actually, that's not so interesting. I think what that is, is it's just showing that your, your wisdom is developing. Yeah, and with that, your renunciation. Yeah, that's great. Wisdom, renunciation, and just your capacity for noticing subtlety of virtue. And yeah, it's the more you're able to see nuance and subtlety in virtue, the more you're able to participate in the joy of virtue. I mean, in Theravada, we give the five precepts. People take it on. I abstain from taking the life of any living creature, from taking on what, that what's not given, from sexual misconduct, from lying, from taking intoxicants. And that's basically it, but this sutta, which you talk about, takes all five of those and each four of those. So one refrains oneself, one approves, encourages, and praises others. So it's five times four, so you got 20 different things. And it's just more to be more to rejoice in. And I think it, it does cause a little bit of, of dissonance. Like if someone has a more, a, a deeper um, moral sensitivity, like they don't, buy meat because meat buying meat is approving of someone else killing like in a traditional Theravada context you won't really hear teachers talk to that level of morality um yeah if as long as you don't i'm not killing the animal myself so that's good enough and that's good that's great that we're not killing ourselves but when you get this yeah, increased sensitivity um it's great because you can rejoice in that, but it's really hard to talk about with people who don't yet have that sensitivity. There's a sutta in the Pali Canon where the Buddha says that when you talk about generosity to people who aren't generous, then they don't wanna hear it. And when you talk about like suttas to people who aren't learned, then they don't wanna hear it. And when you talk about subtleties and refinement and sensitivity of virtue, morality, precepts, and they don't have any of that, it's a, like, 
get out of my face, dude. You know, I didn't come to the monastery to have you tell, tell me, you know, what I'm going to buy in my grocery store. Um, so yeah, just being sensitive to that. And when people are open to it, then you can see the light. I mean, yeah, it brings a lot of joy to people who it's, it's, it's not even a question. They've been, yeah, knowing the sentience of other beings and respecting that for so long that it's, uh, they've got a deeper connection to that. So it's hard to, it can be hard to talk about with other people. So venerable, this is in the context of what you mentioned about training. Um, that you know you were sent to a situation that would um, en enable you to work on your anger. And I imagine though that you know that situation also then impacted all of the other people involved. And so I was thinking of you know a hypothetical situation where you took one of the people here who are uh, maybe people pleasers and decided to put that person in charge of the kitchen, for instance, knowing that that would force them to work on their people pleasing, but it's also going to have an impact on the rest of the community. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you navigate um, thinking about harmony in the community versus knowing that you know this person needs training and maybe throwing them into a certain role would really help with that. Yes, yeah, so harmony is important, uh, but I don't expect um, everybody to like what I say. And so I say what I think, and they like it or they don't like it. Um, but hopefully, uh, it'll make them reflect, and from that reflection, they'll they'll learn something. Yeah. So I, I'm not. Uh, kind of thinking in advance, oh, let's see, who can I put in a difficult situation? So they'll go, oh, who's too sensitive to do that? <laughs> you know, who's people pleaser? Oh, there's so many of them. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I, I don't really mm, plan it like that. But were you always willing to say things which were not so pleasing to other people? Is that just? Uh, um, I I try very often. I I um, I don't say it directly. You know, I don't kind of look and say, "You're stupid." You know, that <laughs> thinking like that is stupid. Once in a while, I will. Yeah, <laughs> once in a while. But usually, I don't know, you know, because you can't always say things directly to people. They're so, like, sensitive, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, and, um, yeah, so you have to be careful. But, uh, so, but sometimes saying things uh, in a joking way, but making sure you know, hoping that they understand it. Um, sometimes just in saying something, very often I don't say something to the individual, yeah, but I'll say something to the whole group, hoping that the per person who it's directed to will hear it. But like she pointed out, sometimes you think it's the other person who <laughs> the statement's for. You know, you win some, you lose some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't try and obviously insult people. So you're a monastery of two <laughs> at this point. Is that true that the two of you are um, in the Seattle area? So how do you work out? your differences. It's like there's a there's a larger community here. So how does that work for you two? Like a mini rock tumbler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 
there's, I can only say one thing about this is that um, I share um, a, not Audible, Kindle account. I used to share a Kindle account with uh, Ajahn Ispo, and all of a sudden, all these marriage books were coming up on my Kindle account. I'm going, what is going on here? <laughs> and I've heard it's been useful. <laughs> yeah. Now we're a Kindle family, which is as far as monks get in terms of matrimony, I suppose. Um, shared Kindle library. Um, they let you have a household family. Anyways, I think we had one marriage book, but it was great. It was called The Seven Principles of uh, Something Marriage. Good marriage, something along those lines. Yes, yes, <laughs> the monk in law. No, it's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, the Buddha was operating with a population and a community from unbelievably diverse and contentious backgrounds, the caste system. And the structures he put in place were profound. Um, and people here will know this. But I think some of it can get lost in the mix of traditions and years. Some of the elements which have been just so helpful have been the conditions for admonishment, where one does not admin, admonish another monastic. Un, uh, to admonish another monastic, it should be at the right time. You should speak truth. You should speak to the matter at hand, the atta, or the benefit. It translates different ways. Uh, from a mind of loving kindness, and uh, ask permission and receive permission. Um, and the commentaries spread um, those conditions for admonishment out into you know, other ones, such as knowing the Patti Mocha in detail, et cetera. But um, those five particularly, I find, have been very useful. And even with small bits of admonishment, like he doesn't like my title for a talk or something I said, um, you know, asking for permission, saying I have a little bit of feedback, uh, can, I, can I give that? And there's just, it can seem overblown, but there's such a beauty to that respect. And, you know, so many of this, so much of this path involves this paradox where you'd think that a uh, holding vinya and these structures with precision would necessarily lead to a seriousness and a, a stress, and sometimes it can. But also, it can really, it's like depth perception, where one eye is seeing one side and the other side is, eye is seeing another. So I, I find that having some of these structures in place for us really let us have a pretty joyful and caring relationship. Um, I think another thing that's very helpful is we use nonviolent communication very explicitly. So um, oftener, uh, observation, feeling, need, request, and we'll often label each thing in our conversation that way if things get heated. So, all right, I'm, you know, I'm observing you're feeling a little bit hurt, um, et cetera. Um, and just really going through that process, not interrupting each other. Um, but if someone's going on, you can say ding, and they, they know you have something to say, but you can't actually interrupt. Um, we also have certain hand signals, which can are ways of sort of indicating that the other person has something to say or might want to be speaking. And I think a real useful element has been the understanding that um, we, uh, though we, what is the other useful element? There's something there. Um, oh. A good relationship isn't lack of difficult conversation. It's the effectiveness of repair attempts. And and we just, no one else will call me on the stuff Ajahn Kovelo calls me on, except my mom. She will sometimes, which is great. It refines my, my conduct greatly. Um, but it's so meaningful to have a brother who will do that. Um, and at the deepest level, we're aligned in trying, we want to do something beautiful in in Seattle, and we want to hold each other through our monastic lives, and we have different strengths. Um, but uh, what about you, Ajahn? Any thoughts? <laughs> I mean, I was joking when I said it's kind of like two rocks, a two rock rock tumbler. But I mean, it kind of is. But I just respect the rock, and there's a lot of gratitude there, and uh, the gratitude really does subsume like any kind of hard, difficult conversations. Like it's. Yeah, I just feel so grateful for the for the friendship, for um, situation in, in Seattle and community. And so that really helps just remembering gratitude. And it's very easy to come back to that um, Yeah, very quickly. 
actually, and a sutta I will recommend in the Pali Canon, the Anumana Sutta, the Sutta on Inference, Majjhima Nikaya, the Brown Middle Length Discourses, number 15 on Inference. It's like the Buddha, as I was noticing as the Venerables were coming up here talking about the why this community works, it's because what people are describing is a Pali term called suvacha or sovachasa, which means literally vach, like voice, speech. Su is like beautiful or easy. It means being easy to speak to or being easy to admonish. And this sutta just gives great advice about, you know, predicting 2,600 years ago all the things which we might use when I'm receiving advice. The Buddha says, uh, yet yeah, one might say, I want to be easy to admonish. I want to be easy to speak to. But if you do things that make you not easy to speak to, then people aren't going to want to speak to you. They're not going to you know, want to give you any advice. And some of those are when receiving feedback, you counter feedback the feedbacker, or you insult the feedbacker, or you lead the talk aside, or receiving feedback, you yeah, get angry and confused. And there are all these things. There's like 16 of them that you, uh, it's just so reliable. And it's just like, the, but, oh, I can't do that one, okay. Maybe, no, you can't do that either. And uh, so yeah, just a lot of repair attempts and um, yeah. And, and some of the form, the little formalities, like how often I Anjali him and, and stuff, and he does the same for me, they're, they're, they've been very helpful to kind of frame things because yeah, we are living close together, but yeah, it's, it's there's no one I'd rather be kind of uh, a brother in robes with, so he's helped me in so many ways and given me a, so much, so it's truly. We first became close when we camped out together on a tudong wandering up California in a field of poison oak, so it's all been uphill since then. <laughs> <laughs> I was often gone when I was at the university. Um, I would only come up during the winter, winter and breaks, winter breaks a month, and then summer breaks two or three months. And but now I'm up here full time. Graduated in May, so yeah, I finished. Yeah, which was in May. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. 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 We're giving great marriage advice for being together for a month and a half. Yeah. But there's all this great advice about the conditions that one needs to do to keep a marriage working, and we are working on those conditions. So. And we actually did live together for quite a long, for years before this, just not as whatever we are. <laughs> it doesn't feel like a honeymoon sometimes. <laughs> I think we got to wrap wrap up. Would you have any final words of wisdom for all of us, Venerable, before as a final thing? Lovely. That's it. <laughs> You've already given us plenty. <laughs> no, Venerable. Um, I, so I, I said it before, but you've uh, you were instrumental in me taking robes, and what you've created here. We were just reflecting earlier. It's it is one of the most harmonious, if not the most, har most harmonious community we've almost ever seen. And it's just such a bright light in this day and age. And just for everything you and, and all the monastics here have created, thank you. And as we do start things in Seattle, um, the knowledge that we're developing this friendship and relationship and can look to you for advice and all that, um, we really do, do appreciate it. And you can always admonish us directly to... It it is a good community here. I think people are quite sincere. And, uh, and we share common goals in terms of our practice, and we share a common goal in terms of um, establishing the Sangha in the West, and uh, through that, establishing the Dharma in the West. So I think that holds the communities together a lot, yeah. But again, they're the ones you should ask, not me. So come any time. Thank you. Stay for the rest of the week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Good. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very nice. I'm, I'm glad you come. And, and thank you very We've been getting many people here who you've recommended that they come here, and they've all been really good people. So thank you. Great, great. Thank you, everyone. And your mom's a great cook. <laughs> we hear as much. <laughs> it's true. But I think it's quite incredible to have a mom that is a, a practitioner. Yeah. It's even more incredible to have a, a son that's a monastic. Yeah. <laughs> it's always the bar is always here. For <laughs> it's pretty good having you, mom. I don't know. <laughs>